My name is Susanna DeBaca, and I'm the president of Business Publications Corporation and the publisher of DSM Magazine. And I want to welcome you to the second of our Lifting the Veil series on the mental health effects of COVID-19 called Life Interrupted. DSM Magazine has long been committed to the health and well-being of our community. And about four years ago, at su the suggestion of one of our team members, Jordan Croft, we launched a publication to address mental health. We called it Lifting the Veil in reference to the need to reduce stigma around mental health. Last year, we added an event um, with a panel discussion, um, and we plan to do the same thing for this year. But then COVID-19 happened. We quickly realized that there was a need to shine a light on how this situation will have a short and long-term impact on the community. And this series came together very, very quickly in record time, thanks to our team here at DSM Magazine and to a terrific slate of sponsors from the corporate and nonprofit world. So I wanna give a very quick shout out to the DSM team who's come together to make this happen. Christine Riccelli, our editor-in-chief, Larry Erickson, Luke Manderfeld, who's steering on this webinar today, Sean Rakina, Emily Schultz, Yolanda Crystal, Rebecca Zoot, Jordan Croft, and Rochelle Kilberg. Um, Luke is managing the video, as I said, and this is just our second one with this technology, so we'll hope that you'll give us a little leeway if our technology has problems um, from time to time, but we'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed. I also want to thank our sponsors who made this program possible. Our special thanks to our presenting sponsor, Delta Dental. Our supporting sponsors are United Way of Central Iowa, Clive Behavioral Health, which is a partnership with Mercy One. Our sustaining sponsors, Mid-Iowa Health Foundation, Employee and Family Resources, Make It Okay, UCS Healthcare and Des Moines University. As I mentioned, this is the second in our series and today we're going to be focusing on college students. Here is how the program is going to work. I'll share a video where we'll hear from college students themselves, we'll introduce our speakers and then start with the panelists. Um, at the end, if we have time, I'll open it up for questions from the audience I'm already, or, excuse me, I've already received a couple of questions from people as they were registering that, and I've integrated those questions already into some of what I'm going to be asking the panelists. So first, let's hear from some college students themselves. Luke, can you roll the video? Um, I would say one of the biggest challenges of distant learning is um, not really getting as much interaction with the people in my class and my uh, professor. I'm in landscape architecture, and so horticulture is huge in what we do, and learning and identifying plant habit and growth is almost impossible from your living room chair, you know. I mean, becoming a licensed veterinarian, um, there was always that worry that having the college shut down and clinical rotations be canceled, that we weren't going to be able to get licensed or graduate on time. We had established kind of relationships with each other in class, uh, so it was easier uh, to learn and talk about things because we all kind of uh, knew our stride and stuff. I think that would have been harder if we had started the semester online. For me, I really associate my activities with space. So I miss having to study at, you know, the study spaces in my college or the library. I'm, I'm here on this farm where there are things that have to get done every day. And um, my family aren't even, you know, crop farmers or dairy farmers. So I can't imagine what that would be like. Probably the biggest thing that I worry about is just 
not being able to go to back to school in the fall. I think there has been some positive learning coming out of this pandemic. For instance, I think it's shown just about everybody that remote work is possible. Um, but I think it's also shown that there's a distinct value in being together. And so I think that hopefully as we move past this pandemic, the flexibility that's been offered during the pandemic is able to be continued in some way. Well, it's clear even from this small group of students who have commented that there's an enormous amount of change that is happening as a result of COVID-19 uh, from everything uh, from jobs to their living situation, uh, to their testing, uh, to their interaction with each other. So that's what we're here to explore today. So now I'd like to introduce our panelists um, our first panelist is Dr. Angela Franklin, who is the president of Des Moines University, which is a medical school located here in Des Moines. Um, Dr. Franklin has been a leader, not only in education, um, but also uh, very involved in the Des Moines community in a, a number of boards and organizations. Secondly, we have Dr. William Shep, who is uh, a physician uh, in family medicine at the Iowa Clinic, and he will be um, the psychologist who is weighing in from more of a counseling perspective today. So thank you and welcome, Dr. Shep. Next up, we have Maddie Dwelly. Um, Ma Maddie is a graduating senior at Drake University. Uh, she is a member of the Student Senate, and she is also the Chief of Staff at the Harkin Institute on Drake's campus. Uh, welcome, Maddie. Uh, next up, we have Anna Kaushik. She is a graduating senior at Iowa State University in the Ivy College of Business. Um, uh, Anna was to be the Grand Marshal at Iowa State's uh, graduation ceremony uh, this weekend, and I think she's going to be doing that virtually now. It will be interesting to hear uh, from her. And finally, um, we welcome Rob Denson, who's the president of Des Moines Area Community College, or DMAC. Uh, Rob has long been a leader in education and a strong voice, uh, not only for education, but for the mental health of students at his university and beyond. So welcome to our esteemed panelists. We're very pleased that you were able to take the time to be here with us today. And I'd like to um, thank Delta Dental, um, our presenting sponsor. Um, they have made this possible. And I'd like to give the floor to Gretchen Hageman, who uh, is a Delta Dental uh, team member. Gretchen? Luke, I think we've got Dr. Shep showing and we'd like to hear from Gretchen if possible. <laughs> Perfect. Good afternoon, my name is Gretchen Hageman. I am the Vice President of Government Programs at Delta Dental. Over the past few months, the COVID-19 outbreak has dramatically altered our daily life. Organizations around Iowa and in, around the country have moved quickly to assess how to protect one another and how we could lend a hand to our neighbors in need. I'm very fortunate to work in an organization like Delta Dental. As a health and wellness company, we understand not only the importance of physical health, but also emotional well-being. This is why I am so pleased to support the Lifting the Veil series and the important messages it brings to Iowans during this time. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Gretchen, and thank you very much to Delta Dental. So let's go ahead and start the panel. And the first question that I have, I'm going to ask every single panelist to answer um, a couple of, of minutes, um, but it's, it's kind of the big uh, overarching question. What are the biggest mental health challenges posed to college students by the coronavirus situation? Dr. Franklin, let's start with you. Okay, thank you, Susanna. And it's a pleasure to be a part of the panel today. Um, I would like to just start by acknowledging the fact that as a graduate and professional um, health sciences university, our greatest challenge is 
being able to deliver the curriculum in a way that allows the, the students to continue on with their education. So that alone brings a lot of anxiety for our students to really be able to understand how they're going to be able to complete all, all of their requirements to be able to graduate and become licensed pro professionals. Uh, we have a mixture of clinical and non-clinical programs at Des Moines University. Um, what's really most important to our students um, is to figure out how they can continue on given that a lot of those experiences for them are experiential. They need to be in a hospital setting, they have practical experiences, they need to be able to touch and feel and provide care. Um, so to be able to convert that curriculum to something that is different than what would be the typical way of delivering it creates in, in itself a lot of anxiety for our students to see if they can complete the requirements to be properly prepared to enter the professions that they've chosen. So anxiety around that, anxiety around a different format for teaching um, and learning, as well as a different way that exams are delivered, all of those things compound this degree of anxiety about not only completing the requirements, but are they going to get all of the expectations met and all the criteria and objectives met to be able to be the practitioners that they, they need to be as they move forward. Thank you. Very, uh, very difficult, I think, for students to navigate all of, all of those things, Dr. Franklin. Um, from a clinical perspective, um, Dr. Shook, what are, are you finding to be the biggest challenges? Yeah, I, I would agree with Dr. Franklin that, you know, I think it's essentially the, the uncertainty of all this is the hardest thing to, to, to cope with for a lot of people. And so if people already have an anxiety disorder or, or a depressive disorder, it's certainly pushing that, you know, up to a higher level, just having all of that uncertainty. Uh, or even people who have never really felt like they struggled with anxiety or, or depression before, you know, that they were never really at that threshold where it was affecting their life. Uh, the, the uncertainty is kind of pushing that up above, uh, you know, where they, where they need help. And so it, for them, especially, it's harder because they've never coped with that before. They've never had to seek out help for that before. And so to, to go through all that is, is new to them, too. So um, I think that from a mental health perspective is probably one of the biggest things. And like you said, there's a lot of stigma to mental health. So people sort of avoid seeking help a lot of time. So um, I think that's kind of the biggest piece that I'm dealing with, you know, right now is kind of getting people from not being familiar with having a mental health issue to cope with towards, you know, how do you, how do you have the tools to do that? So Maddie, you are, you are one of the students that we're talking about here, um, a graduating senior. From your perspective, um, what, are, what are the biggest mental health challenges that you and your peers are experiencing? Yeah, so I think that the biggest challenges for those of us students with mental health issues and even students that don't suffer from any mental health issues is just the lack of stability or routine. Um, many students, including myself, uh, very quickly went from, you know, having a counselor at school, a really great support system of friends and professors, um, just, you know, a workout facility even, or libraries and places to academically succeed, um, to, for a lot of us, our parents' homes, where, you know, our independence is stifled, I guess you could say, um, support systems look a little bit different, and that counseling um, that we're used to receiving is no longer the same and succeeding academically is made to be even more difficult. So for any individual that's struggling with mental health, this type of transition can be extremely difficult. These big changes can really end up affecting people if they don't have the right tools to help them work through times like these. So I think that it's just really important for college students to look for those online resources, um, you know, if that's in the form of a counselor it's important to um, have our professors really try to do their best to reach out to their students and ask them what they can do. Um, and I think that it's also important for students to take responsibility for their health and ask themselves, you know, how can I create the best environment for my health to the best of my abilities with, you know, the tools that I do have. And for me, um, that looks like visiting my counselor virtually. And it means communicating with my family about, you know, when I need some time to recharge, you know, creating that space maybe for yoga, a workout, um, and just things like that. So I'd say those are the challenges that I've experienced. Thank you. Very helpful. Anna, what about you? 
Uh, thanks, Susanna. Kind of um, similar to what Maddie was saying, um, echoing her sentiment of transitioning from, um, you know, having all these facilities at um, your fingertips from, um, you know, um, student resources, academic resources, tutoring in person, um, as well as a place that you could call your own to moving to back home. Um, how it looks different even for some students that I've noticed um, as an RA is a lot of international students uh, are unable to leave campus when campus was shut down. Um, so it creates a lot of uncertainty for them as to next steps, which creates a lot of anxiety and fear, which I saw. Um, I must commend, I mean, at least with my experience with Iowa State, they were very uh, supportive with creating accommodation for students who were unable to, you know, go back home or um, leave campus when it was shut down. But I think when there's a lot of uncertainty with where you're going to live and what the situation is going to look like on top of having to continue your education and having to continue your activities, having to continue things like job search, um, again, in a very uncertain time, which we will talk about more. Um, I think it just creates a lot of anxiety. And um, as a student on campus who helps out other students in my position as an RA or, um, you know, president of a club, I, ca I can reach out to them and let them know there are resources available. But um, then again, it's a matter of these online resources being um, as helpful to the students as they can be to accommodate them. But those are some things I noticed, yeah. Thank you. Um, and Rob at DMAC, um, you're dealing with thousands of students um, in different situations. What are you seeing as the biggest mental health challenges to them? I think the one that comes up the most often are students that are graduating this spring. We have 2,734 students that are completing. Uh, many of them are, this is not how they expected to end their uh, time at DMAC. Uh, oftentimes, there are hands-on lab classes, uh, career and technical program classes, skills building classes that were in place for the last term that will not be completed this term and will be completed sometime later in the summer. So I think their, their biggest issue is to make sure they have the competencies so that when they get into the workforce uh, that they have the skills they need. Now, the good news is that every one of our programs has an advisory committee of the businesses that hire students out of their program. So we're working with our advisory committee to actually create the cure for whatever deficiencies or limit, uh, lacking the students may have uh, when they leave us in May and graduation would have been night before last. Uh, Stacy had a good question in the chat about, about her son and, and, and how he faces this changing environment with distancing going into a new job. Uh, the, the good news is that we're all in this together. Uh, every business out there has been disrupted or impacted in some way. So as uh, you, your son begins to deal with his transition to work, that employer is having to deal with how do they transition everybody back that's, uh, that they may have laid off or furloughed and, and, and also to add your son into the mix. Uh, the transcript's going to look a little different. Uh, we've got, we opened up a pass, not pass uh, option for, because courses were so disrupted in, in the middle of the turn. Uh, some have talked about an asterisk on the diploma, uh, something that would indicate that this was the turn that may have changed the, the academic trajectory of many of our students. So I, I think not getting into internships when they thought they would, uh, it, just a number of these things are kind of piling on at one time. And I think it's important to let these students know that if they've got an issue, to reach back out to a faculty member from DMAC or staff member that was supportive of them or to whatever college they went to, particularly if it's in their major, just to ask for their good advice as to how do they transition a disruptive time. So really wide variety of issues. Um, it's, it's just almost, um, you know, mind-boggling to think about how do we drill down and look at each of these individually, but let's try. Um, so now we'll move to some individual questions. Um, and, oh, well, but before we do that, I wanted to make sure that you guys are all aware of um, our upcoming Lifting the Veil discussions. As I mentioned, this was the first um, or the second of a panel of six. The ones that we have coming up 
Next week, our parenting interrupted. So anybody you know who really of any age is a parent um, who um, is finding this time challenging, please make sure that they tune in. On Friday, May 22nd, we'll do small business interrupted and restaurant tours, retail, salons, you name it. Um, these uh, businesses have been affected and, and we wanna explore those issues. Workplace interrupted, almost everybody I think is go, you know, uh, working from home or experiencing a change to their workplace. Um, and then finally, our last panel, June 5th, is on equity and inclusion interrupted. We know that pandemics uh, affect um, uh, or exacerbate existing inequities. So that was one that we wanted to look at as well. You can register again at dsmmagazine.com front slash lifting the veil dash 2020. So just a little commercial on the um, upcoming um, panels that we have in this series. So now let's move to the individual questions. And this question is for Dr. Franklin. What changes in the learning process have created the most anxiety or fear for your students? Okay. One thing in particular about health sciences education is that it's already a high anxiety, high stakes environment. Um, and our students transitioning to online instruction um, was the first thing that had to be done, but those classroom experiences were easy enough to navigate and shift to online instruction. Um, a lot of our curriculum is already delivered in a way that students can review and, and listen to audio tape, videotapes of lectures, but the clinical experiences created the first greatest challenge for us because the majority of our students in our clinical programs are in hospital settings. So to have to pull them from rotations and hospital-based clinical settings um, because of the pandemic created the greatest concern for us because how do you then begin to simulate and replace those experiences for students who would need those to be able to complete their, cur their curriculum? Um, accreditation bodies have some governance over what is allowed and what's not allowed but a lot of effort from our faculty and staff to try to navigate all of the many criteria to be met, to maintain accreditation, to give the students those rich learning experiences that they must have to continue on in their education. Being a health sciences university, medical school in particular, they don't end with us. They need to go on for advanced training in other, in other places for residency training. So another high stakes kind of environment for them to be able to continue to compete for those, those residency programs that they must do after they leave us. So all of those variables from those changing ways of delivering the curriculum for the basic science students and, and those students who are in the classrooms and those lab experiences that need to be converted to something different to then how do you then assess those experiential learning experiences given that now you're no longer face-to-face, -face, direct contact to be reviewed and, and, and assessed in terms of those experiential experiences. That in and of itself creates a considerable amount of anxiety for our students. Um, then how do you navigate being able to be out on rotations and travel? And our greatest concern was the fact that a lot of our students are all around the country. You know, how do we get them back? How do we make sure that they're in safe surroundings? How, how can we first do that to ensure that they're meeting those needs and being safe while they're doing those things. So there was a very a number of experiences that had to be a, a disrupted and now trying to evolve to a new place. Our faculty are busy trying to navigate those experiences with the oversight of accreditation bodies. Well, I, I cannot even imagine um, trying to shift to all online testing, navigating Zoom calls at work is, is hard enough. Um, so Anna um, talked a little bit about um, having international students and some of those. So my next question is for Dr. Shupp. Uh, college students that were sent home from international study and sent home from campuses. How is this affecting their mental health or well-being? Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, that kind of gets to what I was talking about before, just the, the shock of all of this change all at once and, and the uncertainty of what's coming next, I think is really affecting people's mental health profoundly. Uh, and I think it's just taking, taking that anxiety and that, you know, depression up, up another notch or, or two. And, you know, there are a couple of questions coming in from, from some of the audience people, you know, with pretty similar situations where, you know, people are at home in an environment that's not good for them or just graduating from college and not sure about what they're going to do next and not knowing what they want to do because they're kind of in a shock type of a phase. And I'm definitely seeing a lot of that. Um, but you got, you have to give them credit for their resiliency and their, you know, their insight too. I mean, I think a lot of these students are, they're working really hard and I'll see my patients at high V, uh, my, my college student patients working at high V or, or, you know, Earl May when I'm going to the store, you know, these, these kids who should be in school or would be in school uh, and they're working instead. So you have to give them a lot of credit. Uh, but I think the biggest thing is talking about your emotions uh, with family members and with your friends and also, you know, seeking help uh, if you if you feel like it's getting up to a level where, you know, your function is being affected and, and whether that's just doing talk therapy or uh, talking to your primary care doc or a psychiatrist about doing medications as well as talk therapy. I think the biggest first step really is just kind of uh, assessing yourself for how things are going and talking to the people around you and then, and then you know, getting help if, if you need it. So that is a little bit about the, you know, the logistics and things like that affecting mental health. Let's turn a little bit to some of the social aspects. So Maddie, this question is for you. What does the interruption in the social activities or milestones like graduation uh, mean for college students? I can definitely speak to this question as a graduating senior. Um, you know, my spring semester and summer have definitely been interrupted, uh, which can be pretty disappointing for those of us that have been looking forward to celebrating our graduation with friends and family. Um, for me, it's specifically meant missing out on the chance to walk across the stage for graduation and receive my diploma. Um, it's meant missing my last Drake relays, if anyone is familiar with that. Um, and then just my senior celebration with my sorority sisters, which was supposed to be this last week. Um, so it's just a little bit disappointing. But um, and additionally, just this morning, my summer internship in the Senate was canceled. But I'm still moving to DC next month without a job. <laughs> but these experiences, I guess, have kind of left me in two different headspaces. Um, the first being one of gratitude that I've been able to spend time at home with my family before moving. But the second, which I'm sure a lot of college students are feeling, is frustration and just disappointment. Um, this interruption that COVID is has kind of meant a lot of instability for those of us that were hoping to enter the workforce and aren't really sure what to do now. Um, for me, I think the toughest part was actually leaving my sorority house. Um, I never thought I would join a sorority before coming to Drake, but it ended up being my support system, you know, my happy place, so to speak, and my home. And having to move out at the drop of a hat was really difficult for me. So I think that it just brings about a lot of uncertainty and, you know, just in being ripped, so to speak, um, from the opportunity to make those last memories with our friends and family before leaving school. So. I would just say that, you know, that is all these different little things are kind of how the interruption of COVID has affected college students. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maddie. Uh, we talked a little bit, I think I just heard you, you say and Dr. Shep as well about um, the job offers, um, Rob Denson as well. So Anna, let me ask you this question. Um, what are your peers' biggest concerns about internships that have been canceled or job offers that have been put on hold or completely rescinded? Certainly, Susanna. Um, I feel, um, you know, kind of echoing a lot of sentiment that's been said, but um, there's two sides to this. A lot of college students also work 
part-time, um, you know, whether it's in a field related to their career or just at the gas station down the road and um, having those um, very crucial jobs that support their day-to-day -day living taken away can affect them a lot financially, mentally, emotionally, um, and, you know, kind of trying to find resources again to be able to support yourself financially while being in school um, is a challenge that I have noticed in among students. Um, but the second side of this thing is, of course, the, you know, more structured aspect of internships and full-time job offers. Um, there is, um, as a graduating senior, um, while I am going to grad school, I know a lot of um, students are contemplating what, um, you know, the job market search looks like right now in different industries and are um, encountering a lot of challenges in terms of um, decisions being made slower, not having lines of communication communication with the recruitment manager or um, just there being a hiring freeze um, in companies that they, you know, thought they would end up in. The second side uh, is also a lot of juniors I have seen with their summer internships being rescinded or taken away. Usually a lot of firms um, in the US, how they recruit for their full-time roles is from their internship pool from last summer. And um, there's a lot of uncertainty with juniors not having internships and um, thinking, oh, well, where are we gonna look for full-time job offers now? Because that is a big way of getting into the industry. Um, so I think at the same time, it, as a business student, I think it pushes us to think creatively about how to network, how to reach out to companies, how to find that niche. Um, you know, um, a mentor once told me um, in my last internship was that it takes one company to give you one job offer to start your career. And, you know, um, I know it's not the same story for everyone, but um, finding new creative ways to reach out to people or finding an opportunity. Um, specifically for me, um, I was going to attend a big finance conference in New York City, which I was excited about. That is only offered once um, to seniors. Um, that will never be offered to me again. And it's a missed opportunity, kind of once in a lifetime, but at the same time thinking that I have my whole professional life ahead of me. And I'm sure there will be countless opportunities coming forward. So having a positive mindset is all we can do. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, Rob Denson, uh, the question that I have for you um, is, what will the interruption in education today mean for college kids who are joining the workforce in the future? Well, I think in the end, uh, get, looking at the long look, uh, things generally work out for the best. And I think those students that really begin to, to again, talk with their faculty members or those that they've been working with to make sure that they identify any deficiencies that they might have and then specifically address them. Uh, I think we've had some great comments here about the, the changes and challenges that students are, are facing and clearly it's been disappointing. Uh, but I think that those students who take the positive attitude as Anna just said, uh, will be the most likely to, to uh, do well in the shorter term uh, because the companies are going to be looking for talent. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer that the economy will come back and come back fairly strong as fast as it can. Uh, and yes, we may have a few more months of turmoil, uh, but we'll always remember 2020. And uh, those, again, that, that attack the issues that they have, if they've got a deficiency, take this time to, to pick up an additional skill, figure out how to do it, and then maintain those networks uh, with those adults who have been mentors. And I, and I think that, that we're all going to come through this all right. Thank you for those words of optimism and, uh, and experience. Uh, the next thing I want to do is just simply um, steer you to some of our publications in case you are unfamiliar with them. Um, we at DSM are very proud of our newsletters. They are free if you are not aware and would like to subscribe um, at dsmmagazine.com. You can uh, find information on our DSM Weekly, DSM Weekend. We also have a newly launched statewide, IA st statewide newsletter, and we have a newsletter called DSM Wealth. If you'd like to um, subscribe to our print magazine, you can go to dsmmagazine.com 
Um, you can read the latest in arts, culture, food and dining and more, but we also have specialty publications around things like inclusion and around um, this very topic, mental health. Um, and you would get those as part of your subscription. And finally, I wanna encourage everybody, if you are enjoying this panel and finding it of value, uh, please mark your calendar on November 19th. We'd have a regularly planned panel um, on mental health. And I think it will probably be heavily informed by the discussions that we're having right now during COVID-19. So now on to um, some open questions. Um, one of the first questions that I received from a registrant, um, and I think I'll, I'll um, ask Dr. Shep, is um, the person says, I have a college student who is home, who will not leave her room, is not engaging. How do I know when something is serious depression and what can I do as a parent? Yeah, you know, I would say a lot of the time, uh, what brings the the teenager or the college student or the 20 something into the office is the parent. So, you know, step one for sure is talk, you know, try, try to engage, you know, your child and, and talk about it and just be very upfront about talking about emotions, you know, how are things going, you know, what, what, what can we, what can we do to help? And, you know, just sort of normalizing it and bringing it up that, you know, we, we can, you know, talk to people about this, you know, you talk, talk to your family, of course, and then also you talk to a therapist and talk to your doctor. And there are a lot of things that, you know, can help uh, that wouldn't necessarily be permanent things. And, you know, like, like everybody's been saying, this COVID thing will eventually pass um, and we're going to come through this, but, um, but you need, you need the tools to, to get you through it. And if you're, if you're in a bad place, then, then it's time to, to talk about it. Thank you, that's very helpful. Now let's talk about um, some of those stressors that came up and I'll, um, I'll direct this question at Anna and Maddie, um, but um, we heard a little bit about um, some of the logistical and legal issues um, that have emerged, things like housing, food, even immigration status have been affected by COVID-19. How um, have those types of really stressful issues um, affected students' mental health? I'll start with Anna. Um, what are your thoughts there? Certainly, Susanna. Um, there are, th for, I'll speak from personal experience. There are three main things that um, really affected me. Um, I uh, am an RA and a lot of my responsibility is interacting with students, especially at this time during residents who did chose to stay back checking out and, you know, even delivering mail to them and things like that. So kind of um, it's triggering because you're trying to maintain a social distance and self isolate while um, trying to do the responsibilities of a job that I personally simply cannot give up because it gives me housing and I currently, you know, um, that's my only uh, residence. So uh, I think that's a trigger. However, at the same time, being responsible and uh, making sure you're talking with your employers and workplace and ensuring that they have those, um, you know, safety issues in place and creating an environment where it's safe to work. Um, so that is definitely one thing. And the second thing is just not having access to spaces, you know, um, not having that critical discussion in classrooms and, um, uh, I was interacting with a student a couple of days ago and they said that they just simply cannot study for finals because they've never been at home to study. They, all, they are used to being in the library where, you know, there are resources such as um, uh, animals and, you know, um, coloring books that take your stress off of studying um, and just an environment of group study and things like that. So I think it is very challenging to transition overnight into a new environment. Thank you, very helpful. And Maddie, um, same question. Um, talk about some of the logistical or legal issues like housing or food, immigration status or space um, that is affecting students' mental health. I think I can definitely speak to the housing aspect. Um, when I had to leave my sorority house, I had two days to find a new place to live. Um, and thankfully, uh, I'm super grateful to my parents because that was an option for me to, or moving home for me was an option. 
Um, but I know that for a lot of my friends who still had jobs that they had to attend um, and, you know, go to every day while still being in Des Moines, um, they had to find alternative housing. Um, so that meant either, you know, staying on a friend's couch or, or trying to work with the university. Um, but I think the greatest tool that we have here in this situation is just communication and really trying to look at the resources that we do have. Um, but I think that there are some things that people don't have access to, especially when it comes to, um, you know, that immigration status. And I think that that is something that it is a great question. How do we deal with that? Um, but I think, again, going back to that communication, it is just working with what we do have and what you can do um, and what you can control versus what you can't control. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This question is for both Dr. Franklin and for Rob Denson. Um, and I'm going to kind of ask a two-part question. Um, we know that there are going to very likely be some significant cuts in education funding um, that are going to affect your ability to provide support to students. Um, and at the same time, um, a question has come in about how, what are you doing as administrators to alleviate the financial stressors that are currently on students? So why don't I start with, with Rob and then we'll go to Dr. Franklin. Well, clearly a, a number of our students uh, have financial issues as do most people right now. Uh, so we're working with them not only to distribute funding from the CARES Act, the, uh, half of the funding the DMACC will receive will go to our low income students who have been impacted financially because of the COVID-19 situation. So there's some relief there. So we're spending a lot of time reviewing applications and seeking out those students uh, who have filed the federal FAFSA and, and are eligible for that kind of aid. You know, we are continuing to look at how we can reduce our expenses. We've got the lowest tuition and fees in the state of Iowa of all colleges and universities. Uh, be, because we know that, that money is important, everyone in education is critical. Uh, so we've now decided to reduce because most of our students are going to be online this summer. We're going to eliminate our online technology fee. Uh, as you might expect, the technology for online education is extremely expensive, but we're going to absorb those costs for summer. Uh, since most students do not have a choice. They, the online may be the only option for much, if not all, of the summer. So as we reduce our expenses, we're going to pass those savings on to students uh, and, and to work with our faculty to make sure uh, that book costs are, are reduced where we can. Uh, but again, to give them, the, our students, the kind of support they need to complete. Uh, and, and that's been a tough part of this because uh, the, these young people, and actually people of all ages, you know, they come looking for a way to a better life, a better job, a better career, something that's more fulfilling. And this has been a big interruption, uh, but we're just hoping to take a lot of the financial stress off to the extent we can. And we're, we're talking to the legislature about it. They understand that, I mean, we, and we understand that uh, re state revenues uh, are, are way down at this time. Uh, so we're working with them and we're just hoping that they will do everything they can to provide some additional funding so that we can pass some support along and, and reduce prices for our students. Thank you. Um, Dr. Franklin? Okay, as a private university, our challenges are, are very different. Um, unlike um, you know, DMACC, um, we are in a sort of unique position as a health sciences university with, with no state support um, as a private institution to figure out how best to navigate the challenges. We are very much aware that students have the same stressors and concerns about those expenditures and the anxiety that comes along with that, that they would, that students would have in any university all around the country. So universities are all trying to figure this out. Um, the CARES Act, of course, is an avenue, but um, there's a, some advantages and disadvantages to being a small private institution. Um, the advantage is that we have great opportunity to interact more closely with our students. We, our numbers are small. But when it comes to some of these resources that are out there, for instance, the CURES Act, the funding that comes out of the federal government is based on the numbers of students that you have. Yeah. You know, so for an, a private institution to receive a small amount of support from the CURES Act to then figure out how best to distribute that to a large number of students creates a different kind of challenge for us. And sometimes students may not understand the, the level of detail that goes into trying to figure out how to navigate funding that comes externally as opposed to the resources that we have within to continue to support our students. 
we've been talking about anxiety in general and emotional stress and strain. Those are all valid, legitimate concerns that our students have. We're very sensitive to, to that and understanding of that. But at the same time, sometimes communication, I think one of the students mentioned, communication is so vital. Sometimes things get misconstrued in terms of students' interpretation or understanding because they see other universities that are responding differently than their university and they're assuming something's not right with this, as opposed to understanding that there are nuances and differences and the, the makeup and the infrastructure of universities based on the manner in which those universities are, are operating. So we are very sensitive to the fact that our students continue to have concerns about financial stresses and strains. We have support coming through our financial aid offices, resources that we can do our best job of trying to make available to students. That process is, is beginning. Um, but the challenge is how do you navigate all of those many nuances, given that we don't have access to some of the resources that different type universities might have. Uh, being supportive of our students is our number one priority, has always been, there's never been any, um, any question about that. But sometimes it's difficult to, to get students to understand that our way of operating might be different than other institutions. And as far as our faculty and the delivery of the curriculum, our expenses actually went up you know, as we try to navigate how we shift an online platform as opposed to going down. So we have new expenditures, new challenges that we have to face as a health sciences university with all the many affiliations and partnerships that we have to do to maintain the quality of our education. Trying to balance all those things as an administrator, as other administrators and other universities all around the country are doing, or we take to heart. And our first and most important job is meeting the needs of our students and trying to support them in the best way that we can. So we are all working on the same thing. We're all challenged with the same things, but it's all about trying to communicate what we can do versus the things that we can't do because those funds aren't available to everyone. And I think it's hard to navigate. How do you do this and be equitable and fair in the way you support students? So I think um, we, when we did our panel rehearsal, we talked about the fact that maybe we need to do a panel on the mental health for uh, university administrators uh, as well. Very difficult decisions for everybody, um, really, in, in almost every walk of life right now. Um, so a, a couple of questions have come in about high school students, and I'm actually going to ask Dr. Shep, um, if somebody as a high school student is preparing for college and they've missed all of these similar kinds of social activities, prom, their graduation, their last semester, how is that going to affect them as they start this, this new experience? How will it affect their mental health and what can, what can parents be doing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a very similar kind of situation really, um, where they're gonna be going through a very big transition a, a lot of the times too. A lot, a lot of my patients are just graduating from high school or they're about to graduate from high school and, and they're going through a lot of these same things, a lot of the same uncertainties. Um, and you know, the average age where depression and anxiety usually start in, in kids is about age 12 or 13. And so, you know, about when you go through puberty and then big stressors are usually the thing that kind of put it over, over the top where they end up seeing me or, or you know, seeing a, a medical provider. And so, you know, same, same deal. It's, you know, talking about it with your kid and especially when they're younger and they've had less experience with these, these things it gets to be a harder thing to just, just verbalize your emotions. And that's something that um, my, my wife's a child psychiatrist. So we talk about this all the time with my two little boys is you just start at an early age where you, uh, where you just talk through, you know, what, what emotions are going on there. You know, like you look like you're upset, you know, you, you look angry, you, you, you look, you know, you look sad today. And just, just talking that through is very, very important. Um, so yeah, it's, it's almost even just a little bit harder, a little bit earlier in the process when you're doing it with a, a younger teenager versus a college student. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Rob, um, can you talk about it just a little bit from um, the perspective of administration? If somebody has a high school student, um, I don't, you can't speak for all universities, but um, can, do you have a sense of how universities are going to be supporting new college freshmen? 
Yes, I, there is not a college or university in the country that, has, that isn't going to recognize the need to reach out to all of our new students and provide them any kinds of support that they may need as they make the transition. Uh, many of them did not have the counselors and advisors in their high schools working with them uh, to look at that college transition from a high school. Many colleges were not able to get their recruiters and advisors into the high school to help ease that transition. So, uh, you know, we've got on our website, we've got an ask a question box where you can go in and type it or you can reach an advisor and talk in real time. Uh, so we, we understand that. So if the students will just ask a question, reach out to someone who may not have reached out to them uh, and just say, okay, here is an issue I'm facing. I mean, we can't rebuild graduation, although you know, we're asking all of our students who would have graduated this week to come back at a future graduation where we will have a double celebration. But if there's a, some kind of an, a test to be taken, uh, if their skill levels are not as good as they think they should be, we've got ways to, to help build them up. Uh, we maintain small class sizes for the specific purpose that our faculty can work with individual students if there happens to be something that they, a specific competency they need to pick up on. So I think I would just tell high school students, work with us. You know, we will get through this. This isn't the first time we've seen situations like this, although COVID is different than other situations. We often have students come to us with, with a challenge or so. Uh, we'll get you through this because it's in our best interest as well as you to make you a success. That's fantastic. Well, we're getting uh, towards the end. So I'd like to get some uh, sort of, I guess, wrap um, opinions from you. Of, or wrap thoughts of, of as you think about what we've discussed in our panel uh, today and what you've heard from your fellow panelists, just any sort of closing, closing thoughts about how um, we can best support college students. And, and Rob, I'll, I'll start with you and then we'll go backwards. Well, I just reach out and, and as I say, hug your kids. I mean, uh, we, we just need that some of that physical uh, touching and, and support as you as you say that we will get through this uh and we we are here with you you know we're all iowans whether you're born here or you're smart enough to move here uh we are iowans and we work together to help not only the state get through but we help each other get through and we're a small state we care for you uh you've got a great future because iowa's future is great maddie what about you yeah i guess i would just say um i wanted to i guess echo what Dr. Shipp said um, about those parents that might be struggling with some of their kids that are dealing with um, depression and anxiety, things like that. Um, from someone that has parents that have had to deal with um, multiple children having issues like these is to just really keep the communication open and just create a place where your kids can come to you and discuss absolutely anything. Um, that is just the first step to helping them. So. Fantastic. Dr. Franklin? Well, I'd just like to um, end with a comment regarding our particular profession of students. Um, to train to be a healthcare provider in the middle of a pandemic and to be in a position of really having the calling to be a provider of care, um, there are considerable conflicts within. We have students who are so disappointed and heartbroken that the major milestone of getting to this place of matching to a residency training program or to move on to be of care, provide care and become the practitioner that they had dreamed of becoming, to have that interrupted, to not be able to celebrate that, you know, at the same time, frustrations about that, but also some fears and anxieties about going out and providing care and moving to the next stage of their, their training conflictual feelings about wanting to be out there on the front line, ready to be of service, but at the same time being fearful of their own personal uh, vulnerabilities as they pursue that profession. So I see students in conflict with those, those feelings of, you know, am I ready? Am I well prepared? And am I, am I afraid now to serve? So we recognize those fears. We understand the challenges of, of all of the many issues that have disrupted their lives, you know, our hearts ache for them too, that this has happened, this has happened to all of us, but just be optimistic. Um, we, we too can get past this. Um, I love to see the glass half full. 
Um, there will be opportunities. We'll be able to restore a lot of those experiences and our students will be able to go on and become the wonderful practitioners and, and providers of care that they had dreamed of. So I have that degree of confidence in them being able to get there and continue to fulfill the mission of our school. So um, those would be my, my final comments. Thank you. And Dr. Shep, what about you? I, I, would, I would definitely agree with Rob to hug your kids, for sure. That's, that's a great comment. Uh, but the, the one thing that I want to add that I, I didn't say yet, and I, and I meant to, is uh, that we're definitely doing a lot of virtual care of patients, too, just like, just like this, uh, where if, if uh, you know, if you think, especially for a mental health thing, like it, examining them in person is not absolutely critical, and it can be dangerous to bring somebody into healthcare. So if, you, if you're worried about that, especially, uh, or if you, you just want to have your kid talk to somebody, I know that talk therapy, uh, they do e-visits. Basically, every talk therapy group is doing e-visits, and every um, you know, healthcare group is doing e-visits. So any primary care doctor, you could just do this you know, over, over you know, a secure e-visit, too. So. Well, wonderful. Well, yeah. your um, insights, uh, panelists, have been terrific. It's clear that COVID-19 has created an enormous amount of disruption, uncertainty, and change for our college-age students um, and added uh, even more difficult dimensions to a time of life that has its own challenges, um, but that it's very important to recognize some of the signs um, of mental health issues, um, to turn to your support systems, and to really uh, seek help. Um, I want to thank our panelists who have made, I mean, excuse me, I want to thank our sponsors who have made this event possible. Again, a very, very big thanks to our presenting sponsor, Delta Dental of Iowa, our supporting sponsors, United Way of Central Iowa and Clive Behavioral Health, a partnership uh, with Mercy One, and our sustaining sponsors, Mid-Iowa Health Foundation, Employee and Family Resources, Make It Okay, UCS Healthcare, and Des Moines University. Um, we have recorded this panel, and so it will be available on the DSM Magazine website uh, under Lifting the Veil, if you'd like to view it or share it. Um, we will also um, be posting some of these uh, clips on our social media, and we invite you to share those um, with friends uh, if, if you would like to do that. And we certainly hope that you will uh, tune in to our additional panels or you'll promote and let others know about the ones that might be relevant uh, to, to them. Uh, so I want to thank you very much for tuning in, for caring about mental health and for working with us to help lift the veil. That concludes our program. Have a lovely weekend, everybody.